Thanks so much for joining us for Healthline 3. I'm Wendy Redmond. Today, it's all about the kiddos. It's that time of year when your little one may get the flu, strep, or maybe pneumonia. But how can you tell the difference? And how do you know when over-the-counter medicine just isn't going to cut it? The man with all of the answers, Dr. Wolcott of Urgent Care, is here with us. And he's going to be answering all of your questions about any sickness your child might have for the next half hour. So we really want to encourage you to ask all of the questions you might have on your mind. If you're online, just fill out the information on your screen and submit it. Or as always, you can give us a phone call. That number is 318-219-4569. We're going to be taking all of your questions until 1230 as always. So first of all, doctor, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. All right. So tell me, what are some of the main illnesses that kids tend to get this time of year? This time of year is uh, quite a bit of flu. Mm -hmm. um, strep throat has been running rampant through the city, uh, pneumonias, uh, sometimes they get little stomach bugs, and then your basic run-of-the-mill respiratory infections, sniffles and coughs. Mm -hmm. What are some of the symptoms that kind of help you distinguish between the different illnesses? Well, uh, in children old enough to tell us about their symptoms, uh, just they tend to have levels of overlap. Um, sometimes somebody with strep throat might have a little bit of a cough, mm -hmm. but the overlying symptom is going to be the sore throat. Whereas okay. pneumonia, they might say, yeah, my throat itches a little bit, irritated from the cough. However, their main issues are going to be difficulty with coughing and breathing. Um, so it just depends on which system the body is affected. Um, and your, uh, your flus are generally a, an over the whole body kind of process where the body aches, mm. you have a little bit of a runny nose, a little bit of a sore throat, a little bit of a cough, but not one over, overriding one symptom usually, um, except for uh, fever and pretty severe body aches. Okay, so what do you do for little ones who aren't able to communicate very well what's wrong with them? That's, that's, uh, it does pose a problem. In fact, there's been a lot of studies on this of trying to determine just how sick a child is. Um, we use the terms well versus unwell. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean the child doesn't have an illness if you call a child well. It just means that their illness isn't so serious that it has affected their entire body system uh, as a process. Um, we like to uh, get an overall view of the child. How is that child interacting in the room? Is mm -hmm. the child feeding well? Does the child have good muscle tone and um, different reflexes that we, we do on a child uh, to see how they react to us as a stranger? They should cry and mm -hmm. hopefully be consolable. And if they're not consolable, then we call that irritable. Mm -hmm. And irritable is, uh, um, is a symptom of an unwell child. And um, the... Uh, there's been plenty of studies to try to determine are there physical characteristics that we can use to determine is the child well or unwell. And to a point there are, however, the different studies have not been able to show that one symptom holds true in all cases. But one thing they did find, um, you know, in contrast to say the heart rate or the skin color or uh, anything that you would do on the physical exam, the one thing they did find that gives you the best determining factor for is a child well or unwell is physician experience. Um, hmm. Sitting with seeing thousands of them, thousands upon thousands of children and seeing which ones are well and which ones are not well and knowing how their clinical course went and how they did to determine if your determination was correct. Um, and it just comes with experience. There's nothing that can substitute for that. So really the parent's best option if you have what you perceive to be a sick child, bring them in to see their doctor. If there's any question, yes. Uh, bring them into a doctor who's experienced with children. Um, the uh, I will say that if a child has a temperature that's elevated, but the child is out running around and you can't keep up with them because they're out playing and eating snacks and drinking fluids, yes, the child has something that caused a fever, but in all, for all intents and purposes, that child is well. We, we mm. joke that if you have to try to catch them <laughs> to look in their ears, they're probably okay. Um, however, the ones that are just lying there, not taking an interest in their favorite TV show, not mm. wanting their snack or their drink, um, and you can't get them to do the things they normally love, those are worrisome findings. Mm -hmm. What's your best advice to parents? Um, don't get too worked up over a fever. Um, fever is a natural body process. Um, there's new studies that are coming out that show fevers are not in and of themselves dangerous. 
Um, there are some little caveats to that. How fast a temperature goes up can be dangerous and can mm -hmm. lead to a seizure. Um, but mostly we, tr we, we, we don't, we treat fever for comfort. Um, when you have a fever, you don't feel well, your body hurts, you don't participate in activities. And as the fever comes down, all those um, characteristics come back and become more interactive. And that's why we treat fever, but fever is actually the body's defense mechanism against infection. It is yeah. creating an inhospitable environment for bacteria and viruses. So we're not saying don't treat fever. No, you want your child to feel well. Your body can still defend itself against these invaders, um, but fever in and of itself is not a crisis situation. Um, um, so 101 fever is, is, is treatable and you can get your child feeling better and you don't need to, to truly worry yourself to death over it. Now, is there a number of a temperature where it's, oh my gosh, this is worse than the other? <clears throat> yes and no. There's been some anecdotal evidence saying that 102.2 um, in certain age groups um, can be a sign of some hidden infections. Um, however, the child usually shows that they're unwell in that situation. Um, right. And you're already most likely watching that child and determine that they're unwell. Um, and then there are some other numbers into the 103 character uh, uh, categories that um, have some association with other infections. But again, at that point, the physical exam has usually changed or the personality of the child has changed so much that you know something's yeah, wrong. Yeah, they're really not gonna be feeling good at that right, point. They won't exactly right. probably be running around. All right, well, we have a caller on the line that okay. has a question for you. Bob, what's your question for the doctor? Yes. Uh Yes, hello, uh, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I was just uh, calling and inquiring. You know, it's uh, getting around that time of year, flu season and pneumonia and things like that. And I wanted to know if uh, those who have, like, immune deficiency problems and things like that, uh, what, what kind of advice would you give them to stay protected around this time of year? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Bob, for the call. It's a, it's a great call. Um, and factors that we use to protect ourselves against any infection holds true for people who are what we call immunocompromised, people whose immune systems do not work correctly and they might not be able to fight off infection as well as other people. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing that you can do is hand washing. Um, we, uh, we touch everything in our environment with our hands, uh, light switches, doorknobs, countertops, everything that the person that was in that location before you touches it as well and if they have a cold and just sneezed into their hand and touched the doorknob and then you touch the doorknob you have potentially picked up the virus or the bacteria um, and so uh, fastidious hand washing and doing it often um, is is very important um, and then uh, one of the other th one of the other things um, is don't touch your face unless you've washed your hands. The portal for most of these infections is gonna be through your eyes, nose, or mouth. Mm. And if you can prevent from touching your face until you've washed your hands, that will uh, tremendously reduce the risk of infection. Um, people who are severely immunocompromised have to try to avoid environments where people are coughing and sneezing. Um, airplane rides, um, confined spaces where people have the potential to be sick. If they see somebody coughing, sneezing, they might want to try to avoid them. Um, some people go so far as to wear masks during this time of year um, because of an immunocompromised state. Um, I think people have seen examples of uh, patients who have cancer and they're on chemotherapy and they wear masks to protect right, themselves. They don't, yeah. they're, they're not protecting the people around them, they're protecting themselves from the people yeah. um, because a simple infection can be devastating in these situations. Um, and um, so uh, I guess the bottom line is hand washing, don't touch your face and try to avoid people who are known to be sick. Okay, does that answer your question, Bob? Yeah, I had uh, one more question uh, as far as, like, is it true, like, showering uh, in the morning times, uh, getting ready to leave out on your day, does that put you more at risk to, you know, catch, like, colds and flu and things like that with the temperature change? I don't believe I've ever come across um, the time of day of showering and increasing your risk of infection. Um, <clears throat> the if you go back to just the fact that washing will um, 
wash the viruses off your hands. Um, and then you could, you could say that any washing would be good washing. Um, however, uh, typically when you're in your own home, in your own room, and nobody else in the household is sick, then the source of infection is not present at your house. If uh, it's when you go out into the environment and pick up a virus and then you become infected and then you bring it back home, then that's now introduced into your own personal environment that, and it can spread that way. But as far as if you are not sick and nobody in your family is sick, washing in the morning versus the evening should not make a difference. All right. Thank you so much for your call, Bob. I hope that that uh, that helped. On that same note, I wanted to ask you, are there any um, foods or drinks that might help give our immune system a little extra boost this time of year to give our bodies a kickstart when we do come in contact with these germs? There's a, there's a lot of different um, information on this, um, and I don't believe any are fully conclusive. Um, it does go back to the old adage, an apple a day will keep the doctor away. And what they're meaning on that is good nutrition. Um, your body requires proteins and fats and uh, different, chem uh, different um, elements in, um, in its diet to produce what we need to fight off infection. Mm -hmm. All our little white blood cells are made up of uh, proteins that we get from our environment um, for, through food. Um, <clears throat> but you'll see out on the shelf the, the different uh, commercial brands that contain zinc or vitamin C and different yeah. vitamins to help ward off these infections. Well, what it's doing is it's maximizing the building blocks of your immune system. Um, I don't believe it's ever been recommended by the FDA that a thousand percent of your daily allowance of vitamin C is going to do any much any better than a hundred percent of what you need. Um, you need a certain amount of all these vitamins each day to maintain health. Um, and so taking more only makes your body process more. So these, mm. these little remedies at 1,000% of your daily allowance or 1,600% of your daily allowance, your body will recognize that it now has more than it needs and it will dispose of it. It will not store it. And um, so, so <clears throat> whereas there is anecdotal evidence that um, people have uh, reduce their symptoms it's it's because of nutrition and it's because they're maximizing the building blocks of their immune system rather than warding off a virus it will not keep you from catching the flu but mm -hmm. if you catch the flu your immune system might be so uh, fully staffed so <laughs> to speak that it yeah. will recognize the flu and destroy it before it causes a problem so it does go back to nutrition and you can get that nutrition whether you take it in a in a vitamin or orange juice but a good balanced diet um, with some reasonable supplements to get to your 100% of your daily allowance of these building blocks and that will maximize your chances to ward off these infections. These mega doses that you're talking about, 1000%, there have been a lot of reports out in the media, a lot of doctors saying that they don't necessarily think that these are safe. What's your, what's your take on that? What's the argument? Well, the, the safety is that um, anything in large doses can be a poison. Um, okay. These are normal chemicals that we take in every day. You get vitamin C from orange juice is the example I'll use. Um, you wouldn't eat 25 oranges in a day, um, although the doses in there probably wouldn't do anything to hurt you. That's a lot of oranges. Now you can get 25 oranges of vitamin C by taking pills. Now anybody can do that. But what's gonna happen is it's going to force your kidneys and your liver to get rid of all this extra. So it's gonna have to really work. So now. Let's say you do it with vitamin C and vitamin A, which actually vitamin A has been implicated as a poison in high, high doses. Mm. Um, um, <clears throat> all the different things that are being reported to help your life, to help your immune system, your skin, your bones, everything. You only need so much a day and everything that's extra, your body will have to work extra hard to get it out of the body. And so that can pose a problem for some people because your kidneys are now geared up and really churning out this, uh, these extra doses to get rid of them. And um, so with any time your body has to do work, there's the potential for failure. Any risk of uh, normal vitamins? Because most nope. of those will say 100%, and then you're going to go and eat on top and, Correct. I guess, get more from that food. Um, no, in those in those instances, that lower of a dose, I mean, your body is going to process those, and it's not going to be uh, 
uh, presented with a thousand percent. You're going to have a hundred percent of your vitamin C. You'll drink a glass of orange juice, which has a certain percentage of the vitamin C that you need, and those doses aren't aren't high enough. So one vitamin a day um, that is um, runs in that hundred percent range of okay. the different nutrients that you need is just fine. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about uh, when I was a kid. Um, coughing in your hands. That's what we were always told, cover your mouth. Now it's cough in your elbow, mm -hmm. right? Um, obviously, because you don't want to be touching everything with right. your germy hands afterwards. Um, what are some of the other things that kind of have changed over the years with our ideas about protecting ourselves from getting sick? Well, uh, interestingly, there's um, there are some groups out there that are, during this season, uh, recommend wearing masks in confined spaces. Uh, and the best example is the airplane. Um, airplanes have a great filtration system. They circulate their air, but you are trapped in a chair mm -hmm. next to someone who is coughing a lot, um, who, who has the potential to be sick and can spread it that way. Um, but, uh, but that's one of the more extreme measures of uh, yeah. quarantining yourself against, uh, against these illnesses. Um, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the hand washing and um, the use of antibacterial soaps is very widespread now, and there's some good and some bad with that. Um, we need bacteria in our lives to survive. We, yeah. just, we want the good bacteria. Um, we have bacteria on and in us that help us stay alive. And um, when the bad bacteria grow, in our body, that's when illness starts. Well, if we're killing off all our good bacteria, whether it's be from taking antibiotics too often, and it, because antibiotics are, for the most part, uh, indiscriminate. They will kill good bacteria and bad bacteria. So when the good bacteria are killed off in your gut or on your skin, it makes a lot of real estate for bad bacteria to start growing. Mm. And when they do, they get a foothold and they, they cause illness. So um, it's truly the, um, it's just the, it's not, so much the antibacterial properties of the soap that we need. We need what's called a surfactant, and that's what makes the water help remove the dirt from your hand. Um, oh. uh, the, when they made soaps back in the 1700s out of animal fat, um, they didn't put antibacterial chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. It was just the surfactant that helped get the dirt off the hands. It's the agitation of your hands, and it's the plenty of water to wash the dirt and the viruses away. And then, um, like I alluded to before, um, don't touch your face. Yeah. And if you have to sneeze into your hands because it one sneaks up on you, that's fine. And but just be aware that your hands are now dirty, mm -hmm. and don't go and shake somebody's hands. I mean, people these days understand if you don't shake somebody's hand, say, "Oh, I'm sick." Yeah. Uh, don't shake hands. Um, and uh, in fact, there'll be public service announcements about cutting back on shaking hands will produce the spread of disease. Um, and then, um, but the the concept of sneezing into the the, the arm or the crook of the arm, that rarely comes into contact with people. And yeah. usually if you want to give a hug as a greeting, you can tell people, hey, I'm sick. And that's usually enough of a warning to say, okay, I don't want to yeah, come in contact with you. Yeah, because you're going to be breathing directly on them, too. Right. Forget about your arm. You've got and a lot of other things that are coming into play at that point. And so those types of uh, isolation, if you will, um, can help prevent the transmission. One other thing, another thing that we've really gotten away from are handkerchiefs. If you can yeah, think of a more yours. confined object that harbors bacteria and viruses that are from the respiratory system, it would be the handkerchief. Your hand, one sneeze, go wash it, no sneezes. Right. A handkerchief, one sneeze, back in the pocket, 20 minutes later, another sneeze. By the end of the day, it's holding 30 sneezes worth of viruses, and then you're reaching in and grabbing it with your hand, and then handshaking people. So uh, yeah. a big transmission of illness. Yeah. Okay, well, how about this one? Um, when I was a kid, I had bronchial pneumonia. I was out of school for probably a month and a half. I got real sick with it. Um, and I remember there was this kind of old theory of I had a, a fever, and um, somebody told me, you know, put all the blankets on you and sweat out the fever. And I was so hot. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. are you kidding me? This was so uncomfortable. Is that the right thing to do, or is that an old wives' tale? I believe that one's going to fall under old wives' tale. Um, there is some truth in it, and um, it's been distorted a little bit. That goes back to fever being a normal process the body has. Number mm -hmm. one, it's a warning sign that, hey, you're getting sick. Right. Number two, it's changing the body temperature out of the ideal 98.6. Viruses and bacteria, they love 98.6. So if we can bump it up a couple degrees, they have trouble replicating. 
and so allows your body to catch up with the infection. And so there is some truth that fever and, um, and the body temperature being up will help you get over your illness. Now, the problem is, is we feel really rotten when we have a fever, and so we yeah. treat it with medications. However, uh, to confine somebody under blankets, it's gonna make their temperature go up even higher. I mean, everybody doesn't, when winter starts, you get under your blankets and you get warm. Your body temperature gets you warm. Well, if you have a fever and your temperature's 100.5 or 101.5 and you wrap yourself up in blankets, it's only gonna go up from there and mm -hmm. the discomfort's gonna get worse and you're gonna feel worse. Um, now, do you need to turn the thermostat to 60 and lay on top? No, you, you're a reasonable blanket. Um, the way we used to bring fevers down before there were medications were lukewarm baths or walking out into the cool night air. Mm. You can still bring a temperature down with a fan. Um, they used to use alcohol rubs, which I cannot say this enough, is probably one of the most dangerous things you can do is rub somebody without rubbing alcohol. The, uh, the skin can absorb it and rubbing alcohol is isopropyl alcohol, and when it gets broken down in the body, it gets broken down into a poison, and it can cause kidney failure and death. So um, we don't see that very often, mm -hmm. but some of the older uh, uh, generations, uh, the grandparents, talk about that. they talk about they used to do it or some still do it, and we have to make sure that they aren't doing it because so no it will that. cool you off. But yeah. It can make you very, very sick. Yeah, my goodness. Okay, well, I know that it's uh, so heart-wrenching watching kids get sick, right? Mm -hmm. The little pathetic faces and you know that it's just the worst thing in the world and they can't play and all that stuff. Um, but you also know as a parent, well, they kind of have to get sick and build up their immune system. Talk to me a little bit about that. The, um, the term we use is called herd immunity, um, just like a herd of animals. Uh, the human race, by transmitting different illnesses, our bodies learn to defend against those illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they. Um, your body will keep a basically a, a copy or a, a, a digital photo, if you will, of any illness it's had. And it will store that information. And the next time we are introduced to it, we can fight it and usually destroy it before we ever have symptoms. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can imagine if you were the only person on an island um, for your, for, for, from the beginning of your life for 20 years and you've never been exposed to a flu virus or a strep or a pneumonia, different bacteria from that or all the different viruses out there, your body would be so naive that when, if you dropped them in the middle of a city, in the middle of cough and cold season, you will get them all at once um, or the potential to get them all at once because you have never seen them before and your body won't recognize and won't be able to amount an immediate immune response. Now your body probably will eventually you know, start fighting the infection. However, it can be a few days into it whether this virus or bacteria has well, had a chance to, to, to replicate. Right. And so that herd immunity is very important. Um, the, um, another side of that is um, being in school and catching all these little colds. You yeah. have a little database in your body of all these different bugs that you've been exposed to and your body now knows how to fight them. Now there are a few viruses out there that are very smart. There's one called RSV and you can actually catch that one over and over again. Now luckily uh. it's usually only very serious in the young or the very ill already. And then the flu virus, as we all know, likes to change every year. It and does. so that's why we keep getting flu and why we need to keep getting our updated flu shots is because the flu virus changes from year to year or has the potential to change from year to year. And so you have to be vaccinated against that new strain of it or otherwise the old flu shot won't work mm -hmm. if the virus does change. A good thing for kids to get, I know they can get them even as, as babies, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, we go all the way down to about uh, six months and um, they just a lower dose and um, so we want to use them from the very young to the very old uh, because in fact the babies and the very old, the, the that's the has the highest mortality rate for the flu. The flu is uh, still can be a very serious illness for most of us say, well, I just have the flu, I'm fine. Well, the vast, vast majority are gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. The very young and the very old have the potential for all illnesses to be um, a lot more extreme than say somebody who's 21 years old. Okay, well talk to me a little bit about um, the different age range of, of kids. I know a lot of people at home might have, maybe have a baby and then you might have a two or three year old and then maybe you have a five or six year old and all of those need to be treated differently with different mm -hmm. medications and different well, amounts. Well, the, the initial evaluation has the potential to be uh, much different from each, each age group and it, it's based on the physiology of 
the human body. Mm -hmm. from, from birth to about 28 days, that's four, four weeks of life, um, the immune system is not developed. Um, it's developing. Uh, but it is not fully operational um, and the child is very susceptible to illness. Um, <clears throat> the mother confers immunity to the child through uh, breastfeeding, however, it's still not perfect. Um, and so a fever in a child of this age or an indicator of illness uh, uh, such as fever is, uh, is very serious. Um, there's about a 20% chance of, of the child having what we call a, a serious bacterial infection. Serious bacterial infections are meningitis, probably the most devastating, uh -huh. pneumonias, abdominal infections, um, and then um, you know a myriad of any other types of infections. So you go right to the hospital if you have a sick child that age, right? Correct. You should because you're going to be admitted to the hospital, mm -hmm. and you're uh, and it's going to be a quite intense workup. Um, it's not a dangerous workup. It's just we do blood work, you do urine work, you you might get some X-rays, um, and then there's a spinal tap um, for those. It's across the board from zero to 28 days of fever gets mm -hmm. those things. If you're not getting one of those tests then you need to discuss that with the doctor of you need the test, it, period. Mm -hmm. Now once you get past 28 days the immune system has started to kick in and in that one month to three month range there's a little leeway. Um, if you still have a fever and um, you, um, you still will get some blood work and mm -hmm. you get some urine work, you might get an x-ray and then you can make a determination on the spinal tap at this point. Um, okay. You will get antibiotics as well, but it's basically going to be how does the child look? Again, back to the well, unwell. We used to call it sick, not sick, but yeah. not sick makes us think, the public thinks, oh, we don't think your child's sick. No, not sick just means they're, they're, they are a well-appearing ill child. And right. um, if you are unwell, then in that age group of one to three months, then there's a good chance you're going to get the spinal tap. Um, but um, and then once you get past that age group into the three months and on up um, to three years, um, the um, the physical exam gets a little bit better. The uh, once you get to three years, the the child can tell you, yes, my throat hurts, and you can mm -hmm. find the source. You say my ear hurts, and you look in the ear, and look, there's an ear infection. And if you can find the source of the fever ears, nose, throat, cough, um, uh, and one of the places we forget to look a lot is in the urine. Um, but if you can find that source, then the likelihood of there being a second source that's more sinister and hiding is almost zero. Um, mm. It's very, very low. So if you can find that source and be confident about the source, not just, well, the child has 103 fever and is laying lethargic on the table, but he's got a little bit of clear snot from the nose, there's the problem. No, there, we need to, that you, you can't just chalk it up to that. So that's where it comes in, that clinical experience um, yeah. of, of, of treating children. Um, and that's what we've done um, as, you know, we've made a career on it that we treat uh, both adults and children, but to know the difference that an adult can tell you exactly what's wrong with them in the majority of cases and a child cannot. Yeah, because by that point we've, we've had it probably multiple times mm -hmm. before. At what point do you start giving adult yeah doses? Is it strictly age or is it age and weight? Um, there are some medications that will go by age, but um, typically it's going to be weight based. Okay. Um, we do it on kilograms. <laughs> on kilograms. <Yep. laughs> There's a challenge for you. Keep so then everybody you, you have a sick kid, you have to do a little bit of <laughs> math at home as no, well. No, you can do it on, you can do it on <laughs> pounds just as easy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, what would you say um, the biggest concern um, the parents come to you with is? Um, I think it's more of a, rather than just one medical problem, like, oh, are we seeing a lot of strep right now? Are we seeing a lot of flu? I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a matter of wanting to know, is my child okay? Uh -huh. Are they going to be okay? And, um, and, and then getting the proper treatment and getting to the right answer. Um, uh, uh, being ER doctors, we, we joke that we, uh, we specialize in getting answers. Um, yeah. getting the diagnosis and so we don't like to stop until we get that answer and I think that's very reassuring to the parents to say look I've done this test or I've done this physical exam this is what I found this is what I didn't find your child looks great running around the room I think they're gonna be fine here's a prescription or we're gonna call you tomorrow and see how you're doing and if anything changes then we'll change our plan 
Okay, excellent. Well, we just have about 30 seconds left. So um, what's the number people can call at Urgent Care if they have any more questions? We're at 868-2273, and that's 868-CARE. Care. Any suggestions to determine if a child's playing hooky real quick? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My, uh, my, my little girl tricked me the other day. So. Oh, she even can get the doctor. Well, and <laughs> yeah. I guess we're all out of luck then no. at that point. Well, thank you so much for being with thank us, you. Dr. Wilcott. We do appreciate it. And I hope that you enjoyed this edition of Healthline 3 and got a little bit out of it, maybe understand your kids a little bit better and how to keep them feeling a lot better this cold and flu season. That's going to do it for us for this edition of Healthline 3. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.